you may have heard this little anecdote before of little Johnny who was brought into the church by Granny. And so Granny was showing him around the church because she was a sacristan. And so she was very proud of all the bits and pieces in the church, you know. And uh, so she was showing, so that's the cross there, that's the cross there. And, uh, who's on the cross? That's Jesus, that's Jesus on the cross. Oh, very good, very good. And then they walked around and they showed, that's the statue of Our Lady. Our Lady is Jesus, Mammy. Oh, Jesus, Mammy, that's lovely. And then she pointed out the stained glass windows. And, yeah, and little Johnny asks, who, who are they? Who are they? And Granny says, well, they're the saints, the different saints. So there's St. Patrick and there's St. Bridget and there's St. Colin Kill. And uh, over there, that's St. Francis. Ah, okay. Very good. So off goes little Johnny to school anyway, happy out. And the teacher then says, OK, boys and girls, today we're going to learn about the saints. And Johnny's hand shoots up before he was even asked a question. We all love that primary school enthusiasm. You couldn't force an answer out of a secondary school student. But out of primary school, whew, up goes the hand even before the question is asked. Miss, 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 miss. And uh, uh, yes. Yes, Johnny, have you an answer? Have you a question? I know what a saint is. And that's, that's, that's very good, Johnny. Would you like to tell the class what a saint is? Uh, my granny says that a saint is someone who lets the light in. A saint is someone who lets the light in. You get it, yeah? So stained glass, right? Stained glass, stained glass windows, right? Stained glass windows, the light comes in through the saints. The light comes into the church through the lives of people who put the gospel into practice. So that the church is illuminated from the inside by people who let God shine through them. That's why at the end of this Mass we're going to bless our new St. Das window here to St. Patrick, uh, which are somewhat artificially backlit, but the point is still the same. They let the light shine through. The church always has needed saints and will always need saints in order for what we have written here to be incarnate, to be visible, to be tangible, to be credible. No matter how well we know scripture, no matter how many copies of it we have or how many uh, copies of it we find in hotel rooms, okay, if, if it's not lived, if it's not lived, unfortunately it will only remain words, inspired and in all as they are. They will only remain words unless they're lived. Our faith is incarnational. We have to see the gospel turned into, into action. What does it look like when it's put into practice as opposed to what's, what's your theory? Okay, so this is why St. Patrick is so, so important to us uh, as Irish people. Uh, and it's such, a, it's such a wonderful story. I believe there may be a newer movie uh, to St. Patrick on Netflix there. I heard about it. I haven't actually seen it. But it, this would really make an epic story because it is epic. It's, it's epic in every sense. Uh, you've got the, the absolute tragedy of him at home in either modern-day Scotland or Wales. We're not quite sure where, but on, on the western coast uh, of... What's the island of England? But, yeah. The borders have all changed since, so... Uh, there he is as a 16-year-old with his family, the Roman citizens, and uh, relatively, relatively wealthy. So all was good. We imagine that he had quite a, a happy youth. And there at 16, he's taken by Irish slave raiders who come into us. And again, we have to keep in mind, they don't, they don't come and um, you know, make a little declaration saying, hear ye, hear ye. We'd like to ask for some volunteers to come to Ireland to work, if that's okay, if you'd like to organize yourselves there in single file. That wasn't the way it happened. Uh, they would come into the village maybe at night and raid houses and kill those who resisted. That's, that's how you do a raid. Uh, so it was, who knows if you didn't lose brothers, sisters, friends uh, in this raid. But it was, it's like, it's, it's violent stuff, you know? So he's taken as a, a slave back to Ireland and, 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 and sold, okay? So he's, he's a slave. And legend has it that uh, he shepherded sheep up on Schlemish Mountain. Now, if you've ever been to Schlemish, or just Google it, um, it's the most arid, exposed wee hill of a thing with not a single tree. Well, maybe there were trees back then. Probably not, though. The ground is so thin, like rocks break through uh, periodically. But it's so, we went there once a couple of years ago. And the, the weather in Downpatrick was lovely. In Schlemish, it was just manky. 
uh, does no protection at all. It looks, like a, it looks like a Christmas pudding, actually. The land is kind of relatively flat, and then there's this kind of bump of a mountain. So you're, just, you're completely exposed. And apparently that's where he would have shepherded his sheep. Okay, but something, something interesting happens here, something, which, something which, which, in a way, isn't supposed to happen, happened. Where, as a 16-year-old, so 16, 17, uh, for the next six years, he had time. He had silence. He had no distractions. And he began to reflect on his life and recognize that he had lived without God. I remember this is back in the, so he was born at the end of the fourth century. All right, and he, so even then, he began to recognize, I, 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 I grew up without, without God. My father, his father was a deacon. His grandfather was a priest. Long story, we're not going into it. Uh, but, so he'd grown up with faith in the family, but the faith wasn't really his, or at least he had never really accepted it. He'd never really lived it as he should. So here he is on this mountain with kind of nothing else to do. And so he begins to pray. And he says uh, in his writings, in, in his confessio, uh, I would pray as many as a hundred prayers during the day and almost as many at night. So he would just spend his day praying. Remember, this is before the ear of the rosary or the chaplet or, or that kind of thing. So it would have been scripture-based, as much as he could remember, I suppose, from his youth. And also simply very personal. And he really began to see God as his father. Uh, and he says it was there, so on, on, in his slavery, in his captivity, that the Lord opened my mind to an awareness of my unbelief in order that even so late, I might remember my transgressions and turn with all my heart to the Lord my God, who had regard for my insignificance and pitied my youth and ignorance. And he watched over me before I knew him and before I learned sense or even distinguished between good and evil. And he protected me and consoled me as a father would his son. They're, they're beautiful. He's in slavery here. He's miserable here. This, you would imagine, in the mind of the enemy, should be where you turn against God and say, I had a family, I had an education, I had a comfortable home, now I'm here in the mountain, why did you, did you do this to me? And instead, in his anguish, in his pain, in his loneliness, he turns to God. So he, he begins to see the sense, of, the sense of suffering, the sense of the cross. That in, in his suffering, in his loneliness, he turns back to God. He actually finds God. Okay, so it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful story, but it doesn't stop there. It gets even better. Uh, okay, so after six years there, so like arguably the best years of your life, possibly. I think the 40s are pretty amazing. Um, but like from 16 to 22, all right? Uh, at, 20, at, at 22 then, he has a dream where he sees a ship leaving Ireland. Now, we don't know exactly where it was leaving from. Um, some argue that it might have been actually down here in Waterford. Yeah, if you're up in Antrim, around there, the coast isn't that far away, so it, it could have been just simply go east a bit, but we don't really know, so we don't know. Um, but anyway, either way, uh, he sees in a dream this, this ship leaving, so he gets up and he leaves, just following this, this in inspiration, okay? and gets to, to a port, and there are sailors there. Um, you can read it in the Confessio. It's a bit odd. They have an unusual tradition there, which we won't go into. It's a bit gross. Um, uh, but he, he, he's allowed board the ship, and uh, he stows away with them. Okay. So when they get to land, again, we're not 100% sure where, where it is. It doesn't really seem like it's England that they would get to, just for the following reason. Uh, they can't find food. So... I don't know, it must have been just a, a really a, an enormous forest or something, but the, for some reason, wherever they landed, there, there weren't towns and villages around. Okay, so after three days, we reached land, and for 28 days, journeyed through uninhabited country. I'm not sure if Normandy back in the time would have been all forest, I don't know, but either way, uninhabited country. And the food ran out, and hunger overtook us. And one day the steersman began saying, why is it, Christian? You say your God is great and all-powerful. Then why can you not pray for us? 
for we may perish of hunger. It is unlikely indeed that we shall ever see another human being. I said to them confidently, this is Patrick writing himself in, in his confessio, confessions. I said to them confidently, be converted by faith with all your heart to the Lord God, because nothing is impossible for him. So that today he will send food for you on your road until you be satisfied. Because everywhere, everywhere he abounds. And with God's help, this came to pass. And behold, a herd of pigs appeared on the road before our eyes, and they slew so many of them that they remained there for two nights. Sausages, rashers, and the whole lot. So, so, but just again, we read these stories, well, that's lovely, that's nice, that's cute. You see, you're with pirates, okay, and you say to them, you say to them confidently, if you believe the Lord will provide. Now, you don't know what the Lord is going to provide. You, you really hope he will, because you've just kind of told them that God is going to provide for you, you know? But this, this, this is the level of the man's faith. Okay, so he had really, he, he knew God as his father. And as my father, he will provide. And so he doesn't just provide a little piglet uh, or a badger, all right? He provides a whole herd of swine so they can eat for two days. Okay, this, these seem like small things, but they're very, very important to show the, the faith of the man and how the Lord is actually teaching him, you know, walk with me and you will want for nothing. So he got home to his family. We can imagine their elation and joy. Keep in mind there was no, no way of communicating. There wouldn't even have been post. So they heard nothing, knew nothing about him until he walked in the door, Right. He walks in the door to his family. You can imagine they probably would have, yeah, I'd say they would have recognized him, but he had, he had become a man and the beginnings of a saint in the meantime. So they welcome him back and just imagine the, the, the joy of his family. But now something happens again in his life, which is not supposed to happen. Like these kind of things which are just, they appear wrong in our, in our, in our human understanding of things. Not in our divine understanding, but in... in, in not in a divine understanding, but in our human understanding, it seems wrong that in a dream he would see the, the angel of Ireland, Victoricus, coming with a big bag of letters. And he takes one out and he reads it. We beg you, holy youth, that you should come and walk amongst us once more. Hold on now. You're the lads who took me captive for six years. Right, who left me up on a mountain and took me from my family, and as I say, maybe even harmed or killed some of my friends or family in order to get me, and then I, I managed to escape, and now you want me to go back? It's, this isn't human logic. But we'll see in a second why this is important. So Patrick, again, he has become a, a, a man profoundly in tune with God and who sees God as his father. That point can't be stressed enough. He sees God as his father. We shouldn't reduce him to a, just a man who loved creation. I mean, that's important as well. St. Francis, similarly, he's a man who loved creation, yes, because it reflected God. It reflected God. We don't stop at creation. Creation is, is it's a created thing. We look at, we, creation reminds us of the creator. So St. Patrick then feels this, this, this call to go back to the Irish. He goes on to France to be, to be formed uh, in the seminary in Oxier and is, is ordained. There had been missionaries to Ireland before St. Patrick, we know St. Palladius, sorry, uh, Bishop Palladius uh, was in Ireland before him in about 431. Uh, so while there had been missionaries, uh, there definitely wasn't the level of success that St. Patrick had. Now, if we keep in mind, when St. Patrick eventually gets back to Ireland, and there's a good priest friend of mine, uh, who is based in Ard Glass near Down Patrick at the moment, uh, Father Jerry McCluskey, and he showed us, he's a, an expert on St. Patrick, and he showed us uh, where St. Patrick landed, right? Uh, and you can just imagine him coming back to this land, the land of his captivity. Like, would you be going back with elation and joy, or would you be having flashbacks of, of the, 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 the slave ships, you know, the, the, who knows, the beatings, the hunger, the weather, 
the misery of it all. So he's coming back now as a bishop. And he comes and he lands. And what, what Father Jerry pointed out, which I thought was so genius, so helpful. So he lands. And legend has it that a local uh, landlord sees him coming and so releases the hounds to keep away this foreigner. And so the, the dogs are bounding towards him. But remember, St. Patrick was a shepherd. So he would have been used to either kill, ending various threats or befriending them, but either way, protecting his sheep. So the hounds come and he's able to calm them down. And so they just kind of sit at his feet and look all harmless, like little lambs. And the landowners, how, how did you do that? Who, who are you? Now, St. Patrick had spent six years in Ireland, so he spoke their language. So he understands the people because he had lived there. He's not, see, if you, if you train as a, as a missionary in France and you're from England, then you go back to Ireland, you don't understand their customs, you don't have their language, you don't understand anything about them. So you are foreign in every sense. And now you're trying to transmit a gospel to people you don't understand. It's not going to stick, it's not going to work because you're not going to have the same mentality. Like even when I go down to Naples, I have to use my hands or they think I'm not convinced. If I preach like this, they think, oh, he doesn't believe what he's saying at all. <laughs> You have to, it's part of it. Like you have to know their culture and it is, it's, it's part of the language, okay? So he gets them. He understands them. And so then this, this landowner converts and, and they allow him to build the first church in a place which we pronounce in English, Saul, Saul, which, uh, how do you pronounce it in English? Saul in English, I think. Saul in, in Irish means barn. Right? The first church that was built in Ireland by St. Patrick in a barn. So it's still there today. So anyway, St. Patrick begins his, his missionary activity around the country. There are all sorts of legends and all sorts of wells with, bearing his name. It seems that most of his work he would have done from you know, Galway down to Wexford up uh, north of that. There, there are a couple of wells maybe down in Cork, very few in Kerry, places like that, but most of them seem to be uh, further, further north where St. Patrick uh, missioned. But see, he must, I think, Part of the reason he was so successful was because the Lord had formed him in the cross, had formed him in suffering. And without us kind of realizing it, he was forming him also in the culture and language and customs of the people, so that in a short time, he was able to do an awful lot. In St. Patrick's life, he emanated this light this joy of the faith, this freedom which we have in Christ. And we keep in mind that uh, at the time, Ireland was, was pagan, was, was very pagan. So there were Druids, there were all sorts of uh, customs, idolatry, worship of the sun, the moon, stars, all that kind of thing uh, would have been rampant. And of course, see, when that happens as well, that leaves the door open also for the enemy. Okay, like the, Satan still existed back then. So he would try to divert the hearts of people not to the creator, but to the created. And then we end up like worshipping stones, rocks, the weather, the sun, whatever, but not God. Not God, so it diverts our, our hearts away. So, so that this, had to be, this had to be broken. So St. Patrick comes in carrying the light to illuminate the darkness of Ireland. When we think of Ireland today, it's hard not to see a lot of similarities between uh, the island of the 5th century and Ireland today, where we have, yes, absolutely some Christian customs, thank God, and uh, Catholic traditions, thank God. But have we the lived Catholic faith, as in a relationship with Jesus Christ, who we believe is our, our Lord, our God, and who, who, whose commandments, whose word we should live by? Do we have that? I don't think I'm being negative when I say I don't, I, don't, I don't think we do. I don't think we do. I think our standard has been dropping consistently for, for quite some time. And now we're at a level where, I mean, if you just <laughs> ask yourself or ask the, think of the people you know. Would, if you ask them, who is Jesus, what will they say? Will they say, he is my, will, will people, will Irish people say, Jesus is my Lord and my God. And I want to love him with all my heart, soul and strength. You name one Irish person that'll say that in response. Or they say, yeah, he's a nice guy, philosopher, healer. 
Who's God? Uh, energy, power, goodness, I don't know. But we, don't, we don't really know. We don't really know anymore. So, in a way, we're not necessarily back quite as far as this, but there's no doubt that Ireland needs what John Paul II uh, called re-evangelization. So we've been baptized, but we need to be re-evangelized. Not mission two for the first time, but, but re-evangelized. And I think this, this call that St. Patrick heard, I think it's particularly relevant for all of your young selves in the chapel here today in Holy Family, where the Lord calls you, as young people, to walk amongst the Irish people with faith and to be for them a light, to be for them a source of hope, to be for them a source of consolation, to be for them a guide back to the truth. So these words, we beg you, O holy youths, that you should come and walk amongst us once more. This is our call. This is our call to be missionaries. This is our call to evangelize. This is our call to be saints. So we ask the good Lord today, through the prayer's intercession of St. Patrick, to help each one of us be what he is calling us to be, and that we may respond with the humility of St. Patrick as he begins his confessions. I am Patrick, a sinner, and indeed untaught. It was he who summoned me, a fool, from the midst of those who appear wise and learned in the law and powerful in rhetoric and all things. Me, truly wretched in this world, he inspired before others that I would come to the people to whom the love of Christ brought me, if I should prove worthy, to serve them truly and with humility, to spread God's name everywhere with confidence and without fear in order to leave behind after my death foundations for my brethren and sons whom I baptized in the Lord in so many thousands. May St. Patrick assist us in continuing his mission. Amen.